bulletin and stand for our call to worship. Responsive reading from Psalm 22. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he has done it. Amen. Let's respond together by singing number 36 in our blue Psalter hymnal. From Psalm 22, the ends of all the earth shall hear. People of God, congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of the heavens and the earth. He greets us with his grace and calls us his own. Receive the Lord's greeting. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ by the power and the operation of his Holy Spirit. Amen. Take your bulletin once more and let's affirm our faith using these words from our catechism. As we look to Christ alone for our steadfast comfort, Christian, what is your only comfort in life and in death? 
that I am not my own, but belong, body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. Please be seated. As we prepare to witness the sacrament of baptism, be reminded of the, the gospel of grace and mercy and forgiveness in our great God and Savior, we want to take a few moments now and confess our sins as we ask for God's help to look into our hearts rightly as we consider not only our need for redemption, but also our, our ongoing need for grace to sustain us day by day and that we fall short in many ways. And because of that, we are taught through God's Word and through the working of His Spirit an ongoing dependence upon our great God. So let's join our hearts together in a time of confession. Let us pray. Great, mighty, majestic God, we poor sinners acknowledge before You, our God and Creator, that we have terribly and in many ways sinned against you, not only outwardly, but much more with inward blindness, unbelief, doubts, despondency, impatience, pride, covetousness, envy, hatred, malice, and other sinful affections, as you, our Lord and God, know well. God, it is true that we cannot deeply enough deplore all of these things which we find within ourselves. And we confess that we need your help in order to rightly evaluate ourselves, even to look upon our own sin and to get even just a sense of the offensiveness of it. So we ask that you would search us and know us, that you would look into the depths of our hearts and, and that you, as the one who knows all things, would come alongside. And before we focus chiefly on the comfort of your grace, that we would see our need for grace. So we ask in these moments you would bring those sins before us, which we ought to confess to you in the quietness of these moments. O Lord, have mercy upon us for Christ's sake. We repent of all of these things and are sorry for them, but we rejoice that you have given a Savior that we might be joined in communion and fellowship with you. So we look to him, Christ our Lord, and we ask that you forgive us for his sake. Amen. Hear the assurance of grace this morning, brothers and sisters. Lift up your hearts to this truth, knowing that if you believe and trust in Jesus Christ from the heart, with true faith, there is salvation full and free, as God promises. 1 Peter chapter 3, For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. Lamentations chapter 3, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. God is great. God is faithful. He is faithful to that message that he proclaims and publishes to the world, that all who look to the Son, trusting in him, trusting in Jesus Christ, will be forgiven of their sins forever. Amen. 
We have the great joy of welcoming into our midst a new member family who has put that gospel of grace at the center of their lives and wishes to make that known. And uh, we welcome them into our midst this morning, Eric and Beatrice Seifert and their son, Liam Alexander Seifert. So if you would take this form that's in your bulletin. We use this form both to allow Eric and Beatrice to take vows in our midst to make their faith in Christ known and then also to baptize their son Liam into the church as well. We'll follow along as I read. Dear brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, concerning the covenant of grace the Apostle Peter proclaimed on the day of Pentecost, the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Therefore, when converts such as Lydia and the Philippian jailer professed faith in Jesus Christ, their whole households were baptized and added to Christ's church. Ever since the days of the apostles, Christ has been pleased to add to his church both individuals and families. We rejoice in the grace of God when those who have received the sign and seal of the covenant are made desirous of professing their faith publicly and of obtaining the privileges of full communion with the people of God. By this public profession of faith, they acknowledge God's goodness toward them and pledge their lives to him in grateful devotion. What God has revealed to us in his word about holy baptism can be summarized in this way. First, baptism teaches that we and our children are conceived and born in sin. This means that we are by nature children of wrath, and for that reason cannot be members of Christ's kingdom unless we are born again. Baptism, whether by immersion or sprinkling, teaches that sin has made us so impure that we must undergo a cleansing which only God can accomplish. By this we are admonished to detest ourselves, to humble ourselves before God, and turn to Him for our cleansing and salvation. Second, baptism signifies and seals to us the washing away of our sins through Jesus Christ. For this reason we are baptized into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. When we are baptized into the name of the Father, God the Father testifies and seals to us that He makes an eternal covenant of grace with us and adopts us as his children and heirs. Therefore, he promises to provide us with everything good and protect us from all evil or turn it to our profit. When we are baptized into the name of the Son, God the Son seals to us that he washes us in his blood from all our sins. Christ unites us to himself so that we share in his death and resurrection. Through this union with Christ, we are freed from our sins and accounted righteous before God. When we are baptized into the name of the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit assures us by this holy sacrament that he will make his home within us and will sanctify us as members of Christ. He will impart to us what we have in Christ, namely the washing away of our sins and the daily renewing of our lives. As a result of his work within us, we shall finally be presented without the stain of sin among the assembly of the elect in life eternal. Third, The covenant of grace contains both promises and obligations. Having considered the promises, we now consider the obligations. Through baptism, God calls us and places us under obligation to live in new obedience to Him. This means that we must cling to this one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We must trust in Him and love Him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We must renounce the sinful way of life. We must put to death our old nature and show by our lives that we belong to God. If we, through weakness, should fall into sin, we must not despair of God's mercy, nor use our weakness as an excuse to keep, to keep sinning. Baptism is a seal and totally reliable witness that we have an eternal covenant with God. Our children should not be excluded from baptism because of their inability to understand its meaning. Just as without their knowledge they share in Adam's condemnation, So so are they, without their knowledge, received to grace in Christ. God's gracious attitude toward us and our children is revealed in what he said to Abraham, the father of all believers. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be God to you and to your offspring after you. The Apostle Peter also testifies uh, to this with these words, For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. 
Therefore, God formerly commanded that children be circumcised as a seal of the covenant and of the righteousness that comes by faith. Christ also recognized that children are members of the covenant people when he embraced them, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. Since baptism has replaced circumcision as the sign and seal of the covenant, our children should be baptized as heirs of God's kingdom and of his covenant. And as the children grow up, their parents are responsible for teaching them the meaning of baptism. In order that we may now witness this profession of faith and administer this holy sacrament of God to his glory for our comfort and to the edification of the church, let us call upon his name. Let's pray. Almighty, eternal God, long ago, you severely punished an unbelieving and unrepentant world in holy judgment by sending a flood. But in your great mercy, you saved and protected believing Noah and his family. You also drowned the obstinate Pharaoh and his whole army in the Red Sea. You brought your people Israel through the sea on dry ground. In these acts, you revealed the meaning of baptism and the mercies of your covenant in saving your people who of themselves deserved your condemnation. We therefore pray that in your infinite mercy, you will graciously look upon this family for the sake of Jesus Christ. Receive these parents as they testify to their faith in him. Bring the children into union with your son, Jesus Christ, through your Holy Spirit. May they be buried with Christ into death and be raised with him to walk in newness of life. We pray that by your grace, this family may follow Christ day by day, may joyfully bear their cross, and may cling to him in true faith, firm hope, and ardent love. Comfort them in your grace, so that when they leave this life and its constant struggle against the power of sin, they may appear before the judgment seat of Christ, your Son, without fear. We ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who with the Father and the Holy Spirit, the one and only God, lives and reigns forever. Amen. We'll invite Eric and Beatrice and Liam up. Now have the privilege of witnessing uh, the two of you, Eric and Beatrice, and take vows as you uh, promise that you love the Lord and want to walk with Him. So I'll ask you these four vows and ask for your answer after each one. If you are desirous of answering in the affirmative, your answer should be, I do, God helping me. First vow is this. Do you wholeheartedly believe the doctrine contained in the Old and New Testament and in the articles of the Christian faith and taught in this Christian church to be the true and complete doctrine of salvation? And do you promise by the grace of God to continue steadfastly in this profession? Eric, what is your answer? I do. God help me. Beatrice, what is your answer? I do. God help me. Second, do you openly accept God's covenant promise which has been signified and sealed to you in your baptism? And do you confess that you despise and humble yourself before God because of your sins? and that you seek your life not in yourself, but only in Jesus Christ, your Savior. Eric, what is your answer? I do. God help me. Beatrice, what is your answer? I do. God help me. Third, do you declare that you love the Lord, and that it is your heartfelt desire to serve Him according to His word, to forsake the world, to put to death your old nature, and to lead a godly life? Eric, what is your answer? I do. God help me. Beatrice, what is your answer? I do. God help me. Fourth, do you promise to submit to the government of the church, and also, if you should become wayward, either in doctrine or life, to submit to its admonition and discipline? Eric, what is your answer? I do, God help me. Beatrice, what is your answer? I do, God help me. Now we will consider baptism and the promises you make therein. Beloved in Christ the Lord, you have now heard that baptism is an institution of God to seal his covenant to us and our seed. Therefore, it must be used for that end and not out of superstition or mere custom, that it may then be clear to all that you are in agreement 
you are to answer these questions sincerely. And the first promise you make is this. Do you acknowledge that our children, though conceived and born in sin and therefore subject to all manner of misery, even to condemnation itself, are sanctified in Christ and therefore as members of His church ought to be baptized? Eric, what is your answer? Beatrice, what is your answer? And lastly, do you promise and intend to instruct this child as soon as he is able to understand in the doctrine that you have professed to the utmost of your power? We'll let you answer this last one together. If your answer is yes, say, we do, God helping us. This child's Christian name, as I understand it, is Liam Alexander Seifert. Is that correct? We'll uh, consider the meaning of his name a little bit later in the sermon, but why don't you bring Liam over here as we place the seal of baptism upon him. Liam Alexander Seifert, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And may the Lord, by His grace, unite you to Himself, and may you walk for, with Him and live for Him all of your days. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You for this gift, this sacrament of baptism. We thank You for the work of Your grace that You continue to work in Your church. And we pray, O Lord, that You will bring the attention of everyone here to Christ alone. This reminder that as we see the water, that it's only in Christ, in Christ alone, that we are forgiven, that we are cleansed, that we are renewed. Be with the Seiferts. We thank you for them. And we especially pray uh, for Liam as he is raised in the fear and the knowledge and the instruction of the Lord that you would bring to him a vitality of faith and a true desire to honor and serve you all of his days. We thank you for the families from which Eric and Beatrice come. Uh, and families that taught them to honor God and uh, to serve him. We pray and ask for your grace in their lives. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Let's stand together. We'll sing in our songbooks, uh, number 10. Stand together and sing.
Let's sing a song of preparation, number 505 in the red hymnal, I'm Not Ashamed to Own My Lord. 505 in the red, let's stand together and sing. Our Old Testament reading is Psalm 25. We'll be using both Psalm 25 and these two verses from 2 Timothy chapter 1 to consider together today. Let us hear God's holy word as it's read in the presence of his people. This is God's holy word, inerrant, infallible, given to us, his people, for our good. Let us give our attention to its reading. Psalm 25 of David. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. In you I trust, O my God. Do not let me be put to shame nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame, but they will be put to shame who are treacherous without excuse. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths, and guide me in your truth, and teach me, for you are God my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Remember, O Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you are good, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. All the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful for those who keep the demands of his covenant. For the sake of your name, O Lord, forgive my iniquity, though it is great. Who then is the man that fears the Lord? He will instruct him in the way chosen for him. He will spend his days in prosperity, and his descendants will inherit the land. The Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. My eyes are ever on the Lord, for only he will release my feet from the snare. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart have multiplied. Free me from my anguish. Look upon my affliction and my distress and take away all my sins. See how my enemies have increased and how fiercely they hate me. Guard my life and rescue me. Let me not be put to shame 
for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness protect me, because my hope is in you. Redeem Israel, O God, from all their troubles. Amen. And then if you would, go to 2 Timothy chapter 1. Second Timothy 1, verses 13 and 14. Here once again, God's holy word. For the grass will wither and the flowers will fall. God's word will stand forever. Second Timothy 1, 13. What you heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. I like to try on baptism Sundays to bring out a, a relevant truth to God's word for all of us that will be special for the, the family. So I was thinking about how to do that this week. The name Liam means several things uh, closely related. It means warrior. It means protector. It's a obviously shortened form of William, which means helmet of will. So Liam there, in, in my own, you know, I'm not a linguist, but it seems that there's something to do with helmet there, which is a vital piece of armor, protection, protector, once again. Another meaning is also unwavering protector. And so those, all of those names, warrior, protector, unwavering protector, helmet, abundantly appropriate for the eldest son of my good friend, Eric. If you're on his side, he will be your unwavering protector protector. As he's gotten older, more married, more mature, he's become a gentler man, which is good to see. But uh, strength and passion and zeal are of great use in the Christian faith, and oftentimes as the, the Christian church it has failed in teaching people how to use strength and passion and zeal and courage unto the good of the church. Paul calls his young protege, Timothy, to hold fast, to stand firm to a pattern, to a form of sound words which Paul had taught him. Here what Paul is reminding us of is that the Scriptures uh, are a cohesive whole. There's a, a discernible form to it from beginning to end. And when we put all of that together, there's a, a system of doctrine that's like a, an automobile or a, a well-oiled machine. To the Christian faith, there are many vital component parts that if you take any of those out, they will cease to work effectively. The machine will break down and will not work at all. In other words, there are, there are aspects to the Christian faith, vital truths, beliefs to the Christian faith, that when you remove them, the whole system breaks down. And this is, of course, why we have creeds that outline the most basic components of the Christian faith. But embedded in the creeds are several vital doctrines that give shape to the Christian life. We can see many of those contours. And Paul calls Timothy to be a protector, an unwavering protector of all of these things. Why? Why would he tell Timothy to be a guard, protector of all of those things? Well, certainly it's because Timothy was a pastor, a minister in the church of Jesus Christ. It's a, it's a reminder to regulate all of his teaching according to what Paul had taught him. Paul is saying, look, I have taught you what is essential to be a minister of Christ. I have taught you the essentials of the gospel. Do not be inventive. Do not depart from it. Do not come up with your own system of ideas. Paul, in verse 14, uses that word guard, to keep watch. Over what do we keep watch? In front of what do we place guards? Well, 
things that are valuable. And there is nothing more valuable on this earth than the gospel of Jesus Christ. Guard what has been entrusted to you. There Paul would have been uh, referencing certainly Timothy's learning. Guard the things that you have learned. Don't, Don't let your knowledge fade away. Keep it fresh in your mind. Keep coming back to it. Guard it. It's valuable. Guard your gifts for ministry, that which the Spirit has given to you so that you might minister to other people. Continue to fan those into flame. Develop your gifts. God expects that of you. Guard the high responsibility of your calling. It is a high calling to be a minister in Christ's church and to shepherd God's people. Paul is saying you must guard it. You must have great care with all of the things that you've been entrusted to do. But is all of this just so that Timothy or ministers today Should they hold fast to the pattern of sound words just so that they can be right? Is there just kind of a a satisfactory feeling that ministers are to have and thinking that they understand the discernible whole of the Scriptures? They can put things together and they can be in their study and be satisfied that they know these things? Well, no, of course not. Timothy was called to be an unwavering protector of the pattern of sound words because he was to call people to live within the contours of that form of sound words. Because these truths, these doctrines that give shape to the Christian life also have magnificent spiritual value to us. There are four contours that I want to define for us today. Things uh, that we must cling to. Certainly, the ministers of Christ's church have a primary responsibility in all of that, to hold fast to the pattern of sound words. We are called to be unwavering protectors, but all of us who occupy the office of believers share in that responsibility of being an unwavering protector of the doctrine of the gospel. As we consider these things, the context of our gathering today can be a prayer over little Liam Alexander's life, that one day the Lord by His grace would make him an unwavering protector in his life, to his wife, protector to his children, and ultimately by God's grace that he would stand as an unwavering protector to the doctrine and beliefs that are found in the Scriptures. The four contours I'd like to think about, first, the lostness of man, our doctrine of sin, Secondly, the incomparable beauty and excellency of Jesus Christ. Third, the advantage of the Holy Spirit. And uh, and lastly, the mandate to live for God and His glory. The lostness of man, the incomparable beauty and excellency of Christ, the advantage of the Holy Spirit, the mandate to live for God and His glory. If you're paying attention, those main main points uh, in the first letter make the name Liam, L-I-A-M. First, the lostness of man. Uh, The first contour that the church must unwaveringly protect is our doctrine of sin. A life lived rightly unto God begins with the recognition that we are sinful. This is underappreciated and underemphasized by many today, but it throws off the whole system before you even start unless you have a, a firm grasp of the doctrine of sin. If we are not sinful, then there's no need for salvation. And if we do not understand something of the depth of our sin, we will always hem and haw and make excuses that God will one day make an excuse for us on the last day. Well, I'm really not that bad. I've never murdered. I don't typically lie, cheat, or steal. So in the end, I'll be okay. We make excuses that God will make an excuse. It was really from the 18th century on that much of the Protestant church lost its emphasis of these things when it came to sinfulness. And what resulted was what one theologian said this as he kind of surveyed uh, the mainline churches in the 20th century, both in Europe and in America. He said this. This was what they were preaching. It's a God without wrath who brings men without sin into a kingdom without judgment through Christ without a cross. You see, when you remove that doctrine of sin from the beginning, it all crumbles. Everything falls apart. That's why we need to unwaveringly protect it. Genesis 3, we are meant to see that as the source of all of our troubles. So that 
It's the fount of our alienation, the source of our estrangement from God, that when Adam rebelled against God and broke the covenant that God had made with him in the garden, from there, all of the the misery of this world, all of the suffering of this world, all of the ugliness of this world, which finds a home in our hearts as well, we are meant to see all of that beginning there. And we cannot even adequately understand the extent to which that caused all of those things. Adam, ironically, was called to be a guard of the garden, to guard it, to keep it, to keep evil from entering its boundaries. And since he did not, now what we are called to guard is to make sure that we name the fact that we are sinners, that we, and we must guard the doctrine of sin. And if we are to preserve our doctrine of sin, we must be convinced of its sinfulness. What John Newton called the exceeding sinfulness of sin. That we must, by God's grace, seek to know how serious is the depth of our sin. It's not a slight transgression of a boundary. It's blasphemy against God's holiness and deserves the most utter and eternal condemnation before a holy and righteous God. J.C. Ryle wrote on how difficult it is for us to see the exceeding sinfulness of sin. He said this, I do not think in the nature of things that mortal man can at all realize the exceeding sinfulness of sin in the sight of that holy and perfect one with whom we have to do. On the one hand, God is that eternal being who charges his angels with folly and in whose sight the very heavens are not clean. He is one who reads thoughts and motives as well as actions and requires truth in the inward parts. But we, on the other hand, poor, blind creatures, here today and gone tomorrow, born in sin, surrounded by sinners, living in a constant atmosphere of weakness, infirmity, and imperfection, can form none but the most inadequate conceptions of the hideousness of evil. Because of who we are, Because of our blindness, we can form nothing but the most inadequate conceptions of how hideous our sin is before a holy God. This means that we ought to be suspicious of our own ability to rightly gauge our own sin. Why? Because we are blind to its depth. Because we don't have the holiness that God has to see the depth of sin. So Ryle goes on to speak of that inability that we have. He says, The blind man can see no difference between a masterpiece of Michelangelo and Raphael and a painted head on a billboard. What is the difference between those two things to someone who cannot see, to someone who is blind? The deaf man cannot distinguish between a penny whistle and a cathedral organ. The difference is nothing to a man who is deaf. The very animals whose smell is most offensive to us have no idea that they are offensive and are not offensive to one another. And man, fallen man, I believe, can have no just idea what a vile thing sin is in the sight of God. That God, whose handiwork is absolutely perfect. And then Ryle says this, His work is perfect whether you survey it through the telescope or the microscope the tiniest, most infinitesimal work of God is absolutely perfect. And the grandest level of God's work is just as perfect. Everything that he does is shot through with absolute perfection. These two things, the glory of God, the power of God, the majesty of God, and then also the exceeding sinfulness of sin. What becomes of the spiritual response of those who begin to Consider those two things together. There is nowhere you can go but humble repentance. There is no state in which you can live. There is no proper response which you can have other than humble repentance before God. Why? Because you will sense your own misery. And you will sense that because there is no ground upon which to stand that you can produce on yourself, the only ground upon which you can stand is to completely and utterly own the fact that you must repent before God and that you need His mercy. 
Psalm 25 speaks of this in several places. It is in many ways a psalm of confession. Remember your mercy, O Lord. Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. Psalm 25, 11. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. It is not light. It is not kind of great. It is great. My guilt is is great, and my only hope is for you to pardon it. Psalm 25, 16, turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. In other words, I stand alone in my condemnation. I cannot grab this person or that and say, well, at least other people will be as sinful as I am. No, the person who rightly, who begins to rightly measure the majesty of God will say, truly I'm alone in my condemnation. I need the mercy and the grace of God. We're called to be unwavering protectors of the doctrine of sin. And to live within that truth will put us in a place of humble repentance. That's the first contour. The second contour is this, the incomparable beauty and excellency of Jesus Christ. And of course, the beauty of Christ is magnified when we are committed to holding forth the seriousness of sin. The less that we consider it, the less that we name it, the less beautiful Christ is. If recognizing the sinfulness of sin is like being stranded in the middle of the desert dying of thirst, the beauty of Christ is almost like accidentally arriving at a cool spring of clean, delicious water. The answer of Christ to the exceeding sinfulness of sin is that it is the most perfect answer that anyone could have ever imagined, and indeed greater. John Newton said that Christ is chief among ten thousands. Why? Because he is beautiful, because he is glorious, because he is wonderful. A heart that understands exceeding sinfulness will never waver in its love for Jesus Christ. J.C. Ryle offers up that if we are having trouble measuring the sinfulness of our sin, and to realize how sinful we are, we simply must consider the cross of Calvary. Would God have given His only Son if it were not the most serious of matters and if it were not the most dire of situations? Would He have offered Christ if there were some other way? No, but it was the joy of the Father to give the Son and the joy of the Son to fulfill His work. And of course, when we consider the work of Jesus Christ, We must cling with all that we have to the truth that His work is that as a substitute for sinners. That His work upon the cross is one for the sake of another. That He shed His blood in the place of sinners so that sinners can be declared forgiven and righteous. Christ goes to the cross to satisfy divine justice. He goes to the cross to absorb God's wrath towards sinners, towards all who look to Him in faith so that they might be spared from that wrath. If that component is ever removed, and it is removed often today, if that component is ever removed, if Christ dying as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world is taken away, if His work to satisfy God's wrath is denied, the very gospel itself collapses. There is no gospel if you take that away. It's a blasphemy against Christ. It's a deep and serious dishonoring of Him and His work. Paul says, hold firm to the pattern. And here we find the very boundaries of that pattern. We can go beyond this, not at all. What do you believe about the cross of Jesus Christ? Is it merely an example of sacrifice? Now certainly we look to the sacrifice of Christ and The gospel command is to take up your cross and follow him. But it's not merely an example. Was it a way for God to show us our own need to confront our own wrath? That's what some people say. That it was a way for God to say, look at the wrath within our hearts that we killed his son. And it's a way for us to to begin to sort of understand our own need to take vengeance. No. It was work as a substitute for sinners. The very name Jesus Christ is the name God has highly exalted above every name because, as Philippians 2 says, 
because of his work that he finished at the cross. He humbled himself, therefore God highly has exalted him. Not only his work as a substitute, but the beauty of Christ comes to us through his incomparable and all-fulfilling righteousness. Those who are united to him in faith as they are conformed more and more to the image of Christ by the power of the Spirit, as the Spirit breathes into our lives a desire to live more like Jesus Christ, the more we will realize that we are not like Jesus Christ. And so the, 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 to live the Spirit-empowered life that Psalm 119 prescribes for God's people, for instance in verse 2, blessed are those who keep His testimonies, who seek Him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong but walk in His ways. Certainly, we will become more and more like Christ in this life, but also as we come to know our Savior more and more, we will see how inadequate our own righteousness is. And it will cause us to love and to treasure the one who truly loved righteousness and hated wickedness. The incomparable and all-fulfilling righteousness of Christ becomes beautiful to us as we consider it in the midst of our own imperfect righteousness. We consider his glorious power and his exaltation, that his kingdom grows and advances as he uh, still gives remission of sins and repentance from his throne in heaven. In the midst of other kingdoms, the kingdom of God grows, the kingdom of Christ grows. Christ is so utterly victorious against sin that he is able to continually intercede for us. That is how perfect his work is. The spiritual condition into which we are brought when we become unwavering protectors of the beauty of Christ is self-abandonment and faith. When we guard this contour of the Christian faith, the beauty of Christ, what is the result? We abandon ourselves and we turn to Jesus Christ. We will gladly, joyfully, willingly throw all of our confidence upon the rock of ages. Saving faith is a grace and a virtue that looks outward. It looks inward and finds nothing satisfactory. And so we will gladly abandon what we find in ourselves as we see the beauty of the glorious Christ, our Savior. We will throw all of our confidence upon Him. This is exactly what Psalm 25 describes. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. None who place their trust in you shall be ashamed. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear Him, verse 14 says. He makes known to them His covenant. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for He will pluck my feet out of the net. He will rescue me. I cannot rescue myself. As John Newton was dying... He wrote this, although my memory's fading, I remember two things very clearly. I am a great sinner, and Christ is a great Savior. If we cling to those, we will be well on our way to being unwavering protectors. The next is the advantage of the Holy Spirit. The next contour, the advantage of the Holy Spirit. Return to the point of humility that we discussed when we were considering sin. What does true spiritual humility produce? It produces an ongoing dependence upon God because we will always be suspicious that we are going to lead ourselves astray if we live according to our own strength. You need to be dependent upon God in an ongoing way. The Christian life in totality is one which we cannot produce on our own. The Holy Spirit is called the sure and only guide into all truth. This is true in in both a primary way and an ongoing way. It was the Holy Spirit who convinced you of your sinfulness to turn to Christ and to trust in Him. It is the Holy Spirit who has brought to you a correct understanding of any of the scriptures that you have gained in your life. It was the Spirit who leads us into truth. By by the power of the Holy Spirit, we are thoroughly equipped for every good work. It's called the fruit of the Spirit in Scripture. Love, joy, peace. All of the fruits of the Spirit. Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. All of those things are the fruits of the Spirit because it is the Spirit who brings them about. Christian gospel obedience is something that we cannot produce on our own. Whenever you see love, in a God-glorifying way in the life of a Christian, it was the Spirit who brought that about. 
joy, and peace. We cannot produce these things on our own. Psalm 25 says, Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. In other words, I'm waiting here because without you, I'm not moving forward in my, in my life seeking to glorify you, God. Without your grace, I'm not going anywhere. So for you I wait all the day long because I can't go anywhere on my own. True spiritual humility which rightly values and begins to see the advantage of the Holy Spirit will produce ongoing dependence in the life of the believer to say, I know that I need to depend upon God because without Him, I cannot produce anything which pleases God. No confidence in self. Psalm 25 says, Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, He instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble His way. Who will learn? the ways of the Lord. The heart that is humble enough to say, I cannot learn it on my own. I need God's help and His grace. The last contour which we must unwaveringly protect is the mandate to live for the glory of God by His grace. We are called to be a people who seek holy lives and who seek to live holy lives. There is a mandate to live for God and for the glory of God. Love to God and love to man is the fulfilling of the law. It's the essence of our Christian religion. We are called to live it out. Titus 2.14, Christ gave himself to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. 1 Thessalonians 4, Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so, no, do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not, who do not know God, that no one transgress and, wrong, transgress and wrong his brother in this matter. The book of Hebrews says, Seek and pursue peace with all men, for the holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. But the possession of eternal life, we cannot think of that as something that makes God indebted to us. He saves us in Christ alone, by His grace alone, through faith alone. He preserves us. He conforms us to the image of Christ so that as believers arrive at their last day on earth or as we arrive at the day of judgment, God's bestowing eternal life upon His people will not be something He is indebted to give. It will be a gift that comes by His grace. Why? Because it has all been of His grace from beginning to end. I am not what I ought to be. I'm not what I want to be. I'm not what I hope to be in another world. But indeed, I am not what I used to be. And by the grace of God, I am what I am. By the grace of God, nothing else. Psalm 25, verse 13. His soul shall abide in well-being, and his offspring shall inherit the land. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him. And he makes known to them his covenant. Fear the Lord. He will lead the humble in what is right, and your soul will abide in well-being. He will bestow upon you the gift of eternal life. Psalm 25 and the history of sound Christian doctrine carry the same overall theme. God is the one who does it. God is the God of salvation. We cannot do it on our own. And so the call to be unwavering protectors. The call to guard these things can only come by abiding in a God who is an unwavering protector of his people. The payoff this morning is that even as we consider the call to stand firm, even as we consider the call to guard that which has been entrusted to the church, even as we consider the call to be a protector of the form, the pattern of sound words, we need God to guard us while we do it. 
One pastor who's had a profound impact on my own life writes this. He says, we are inconsistent with keeping the faith. Whether it is keeping Christ's commands or keeping our hearts, we cannot protect ourselves from all evil, nor can we shield ourselves from forces that are greater than we are. We do not have the wisdom and strength to keep ourselves, and often we do not even have the desire or will. So as we journey down the path of life, we eventually ask ourselves the question, from where does my help come? We realize that we must look outside ourselves for what we do not have and what we cannot produce. We need help. So we look to him who said, apart from me, you can do nothing. We look to Christ and his spirit and truth and grace. God has given us the promise that he's an unwavering protector of us. So Psalm 25 ends by saying this, Oh, guard my soul and deliver me. God will empower the church to be an unwavering protector of the truth of all that is contained in the Scriptures. But in order to do that, we need to lean into the promise that God will guard us. Psalm 25 says, For I take refuge in you. My help comes from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. As we consider the call to keep watch on ourselves, on our lives, on our profession, on our doctrine, on our purity, we are confronted again and again and again with the sense that we cannot do it on our own, but how great is the promise that God is an unwavering protector of us. So abide in Him, take refuge in Him, trust in Him, and He will make all of these things come to be in our lives and in His church forevermore. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would empower us to stand not in our own strength, but in yours. That as we consider the call to hold fast to this pattern, that we would do so in a way which brings honor to you and that all of the spiritual advantages that come forth towards believing these things and dwelling on them, the humility, the repentance, the faith, the ongoing dependence, the desire for holiness, that you would bring them about by your grace. You would glorify yourself in our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We stand together and sing number 575. Song of response, 575 in the red hymnal, Soldiers of Christ Arise. Stand together and sing.
Amen. Receive God's benediction. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.